Howdy folks, it's me, Randy Ray, at the Literate Texan, here at Driftwood Ranch with my trusty finger puppet, Captain Kirk Companion, bringing you my fourth library tour of the year. This one is specifically a Star Trek book shelf tour. Although, not all of the books on this shelf were Star Trek books. Probably 60, 70, maybe even 80% of the books on this shelf are Star Trek books. So I thought I'd start there since we're in the early, early, early stages of the Book Trek summer reading event. And I'll show you all 26 or 27 books that I have on the shelf, including the ones that aren't Star Trek. And as usual, these aren't in any particular order. I could have ordered them by publication date or something like that, but, but I just didn't. So anyway, the first one on the shelf here, and I love this cover. You probably already know this if you've watched any of my other Star Trek videos, is that I'm a fan of the Shatnerverse series of novels. The Shatnerverse books are the ones where William Shatner co-wrote with Judith Garfield, Judith and Garfield Reeve Stevens, uh, a series of books where Captain Kirk survives into the 24th century. He's resurrected and uh, gets to adventure with, with Picard and the like. And of course, some of his old adventuring companions, Dr. McCoy and Mr. Spock and Scotty are, are still around too. So we get to see them basically one up the next generation crew every chance that they get. Um, this is not the only one I have in, in, in a dead tree version. Most of them I have on my Kindle, but uh, this one is called Spectre, Star Trek Spectre, which I believe is in the second trilogy of trilogy. There's, a, there's nine books, a trilogy of trilogies. But the cover art here on here is really nice. Um, cause you've got Captain Kirk and Captain Picard there in the foreground, but then you've also got Spock in the background and you'll notice he's kind of in black and white there and he's wearing a goatee. Uh, if you know much about Star Trek, you know what that means. Mirror universe. So, uh, retired and happily in love, James T. Kirk believes his adventuring days are over. Yeah, right. But as he returns to earth for the first time since his apparent quote unquote death upon the Starship Enterprise NCC 1701B, events elsewhere in the galaxy set in motion a mystery that may provide Kirk with his greatest challenge yet. And considering how many books they'd already published at this point, that's saying a lot, isn't it, folks? Um, the USS Enterprise, under the command of Captain Jean-Luc Picard, is exploring an unstable region of space on a scientific mission of vital concern to Starfleet when they discover the last thing they ever expected to find, a lonely battle-scarred vessel that is instantly recognizable to every member of Picard's crew. Five years after being lost with all hands in the Delta Quadrant, the Starship Voyager has come home. The commander of Starship Voyager, one Tom Paris, explains that Captain Catherine Janeway and half of the original crew is dead. But if that's true, who is the mysterious woman who has kidnapped Kirk back on Earth? pleading with him to assist her against a threat to the entire Federation. All is not as it seems. Yeah, go figure. And soon Kirk is forced to confront the hideous consequences of actions taken over 30 years before, as well as his own inner doubts. After years of quiet and isolation, does he still have what it takes to put things right and save the lives of everyone aboard a brand new Starship Enterprise? Can he still become the man he used to be? An unforgettable saga peopled by old friends and ancient enemies, Star Trek Spectre propels Kirk on a journey of self-discovery every bit as harrowing as the cataclysmic new adventure that awaits him. So that's a hell of a hell of a sales pitch for this new book. Um, pretty thick too. I mean, this is the mass market paperback version. It's a little dirtied up. But yeah, we're looking at 370 pages or so, which is which is pretty long for one of these Star Trek pocket books back in the day. They also used to publish two kinds of pocket books. Uh, you know, there were the standard size ones, which usually ran around 200 pages. And then they had the giant novels, which ran about 400 pages. The giant novels generally weren't part of the numbering scheme. These, these novels were numbered. And of course, the Shatner versus novels, you know, they didn't count as numbered or, or anything. They were just a whole thing unto themselves that people bought, people read, and the publishers rarely discussed. So this was one of the first ones I read back in the 90s, and I remember really enjoying it then. I don't know what I'm going to think of it rereading it as an older man, but uh, Star Trek, Final Frontier. And then the subtitle here says Space, 
Arena for Man's Greatest Dream. And this is written by Diane Carey. And uh, some of this might look familiar to you down there, the artwork and stuff. Um, that is William Shatner's face, but he is not playing James T. Kirk there. How could this be? Well, let's find out. In the best-selling tradition of Enterprise and Strangers from the Sky, here is the third giant Star Trek novel, Final Frontier. This is the story of a hero and a moment forever lost to history. It is a tale of Starfleet's early days, of a time before the Star Trek we know. The story of a secret mission gone horribly wrong, and an instant in time when the galaxy stood poised on the brink of one final destructive war. It is the story of a ship since passed on into legend, and a man we know only as the father of Starfleet's greatest captain. His name is Kirk, Commander George Samuel Kirk. He is a warrior born and bred to battle. Now destiny has placed the fate of a hundred innocent worlds on his shoulders and put the power of the greatest woman, no, not woman, weapon. Is that a Freudian slip? The galaxy has ever seen in his hands. I've got a joke about a Freudian slip. I'll tell in another, uh, another video. I'm not going to tell it now. I think I might have told it on the video with uh, Steve Donahue. But anyway, so this is a prequel. This was written and published... Holy mackerel, way back when. Let's see here. The publication date's in here. Golly, I'm getting to it, I'm getting to it. Be patient with me, my hands are clumsy these days. This was published in 1988. I was a senior in high school. So this would have been before Enterprise, for sure. And uh, yeah, I think this was even before Deep Space Nine. This is an old, old book. Um, so none of it. Uh, is going to coincide with the continuity that we know about today or the lack of the continuity that we know about today because, let's face it, producers of New Trek and the Kelvinverse, they don't give a damn about continuity. They sure don't, know. An epic story that spans the generations, Star Trek Federation. Star Trek Federation was written by Judith and Garfield Reeve Stevens. They are, of course, the co-authors of the um, Shatnerverse novels. And this was a big deal when it came out because, of course, we'd been wanting to see straight up crossovers between the two crews for, well, ever since the show came on, you know, and they were real reluctant to do that. This came out in 1995. At last, the long awaited novel featuring both famous crews of the Starship's Enterprise in an epic adventure that spans time and space. Captain Kirk and the crew of the USS Enterprise NCC 1701 are faced with their most challenging mission yet, rescuing renowned scientist Zephram Cockrum from captors who want to use his skills to conquer the galaxy. Meanwhile, 99 years later in the future on the USS Enterprise NCC 1701D, Picard must rescue an important and mysterious person whose safety is vital to the survival of the Federation. The whole Federation's at stake here. These are big stakes we're playing for, folks. As the two crews struggle to fulfill their missions, destiny draws them closer together until past and futures merge and the fate of each of the two legendary starships rests in the hand of the other vessel. I remember really enjoying this when I read it the first time. Couldn't tell you a thing about what happens, although I do remember that the crossover event and the, the crews actually getting to see and meet each other was pretty anticlimactic. Anyway, about 463 pages. I mean, it's a giant novel. Nearly 500 pages. That's big enough. This next one was a favorite of mine when I read it the first time. It's also a favorite of Steve Donahue's, as it turns out. It's called Strangers from the Sky by Margaret Wander Bonanin, or Bonanno. And love the cover art for this. It's just really classy looking cover. This must be a bookstore edition because there's nothing on the back. Not a bookstore edition, a book club edition. Yeah, that says so on the front thing here. James Kirk normally didn't pay much attention to this kind of thing. A best-selling book and a controversial one at that. But Strangers from the Sky had piqued his interest, and everyone else's, it seemed. For the book disputed a fact well known to every Federation schoolboy, that Earth's first encounter with alien life had occurred when the UNSS Icarus came upon the humanoid people of Alpha Centauri in 2048. Strangers claimed that history was wrong, that humanity's first contact with another sapient species had taken place years earlier, and that when the two races met, something happened. 
something so climatic, so dangerous, that it had been wiped from the records and kept secret by both worlds for almost two centuries. But when Kirk read the book, it triggered strange dreams, nightmares that threatened first his health and then his sanity. It's almost starting to sound like an H.P. Lovecraft book, isn't it? It was only when he discovered that Spock also shared those dreams that the Admiral began to wonder, could there be more to this book than anyone has guessed? Anyway, this was really good. Really, really solid book. And uh, I'm really looking forward to revisiting it because I, even though I don't remember the plot very well, I remember that it was really good. And uh, some of it involved the peace symbol. I got a peace symbol for Christmas that year, which I really liked. And it was largely because I liked that book so much. Okay, so here's one I haven't read. It's called Star Trek Best Destiny by Diane Carey. The long-awaited story of a young James T. Kirk's first adventure in space. Okay, so this is kind of interesting because Final Frontier, which we looked at earlier, is about James T. Kirk's first adventure in space with his dad. Well, so is Best Destiny here. So the two separate versions of, uh, of the story of Jim Kirk's first adventure in space with his dad. And, uh, you know, since neither of them are canon... You know, it's all almost like licensed fan fiction at this point. Y'all have to forgive me. <clears throat> I had chemo today. And it left me with a little bit of cotton mouth. But here I am making videos just because I love you. They've got us, George Kirk murmured. We've lost. George Cook knew he'd failed. From now on, when these criminals attacked any other ship, it would somehow be Commander George Kirk's fault. He and his son and his crew and his friend, Captain Robert April, the founder of the Federation Starship Program, would simply disappear and become another mysterious statistic. And then a crewman pointed out the window and shouted, look, the enemy ship had suddenly become a wild, demonic nightmare. Its hull buckled against itself, splitting flotsam in some places while it caved inward in others. Whole sections now blew open as atmosphere sprayed in frozen funnels from a dozen places. Slits opened up along seams and more chambers blew open, spewing out everything inside. Good God, someone uttered. The ship spun sickeningly on its side, pocked with holes torn by entire consoles that had come off their mountings and smashed through deck after deck to shoot right through the hull. The hull. What happened, George Rash? What happened to them? Robert April spoke first. I'll tell you what happened, old boy. He coiled an arm around George's shoulders and howled enthusiastically. It was your son. James Kirk happened. Anyway, sounds like quite an adventure there. Okay, so this is, by the way, we talked about this. This is another one of my bookshelf tours. This is bookcase number one, and this is bookshelf number four. And it's mostly Star Trek books, which you've probably figured out by now. So I got another stack of them here too. So as the Star Trek books continued along, they also started forming little series. You know, it used to be they were all standalone books, but eventually you started seeing different series set in different time frames, and they started paying more attention to that. In the early books, the cover art on some of these Star Trek books might feature them in a uniform from the motion picture era, but the story might be set during the original five-year mission. So, you know, they weren't paying a lot of attention early on, but they started to pay more attention later. One of these little series of books, series within a series, was the Lost Years Saga. The Lost Years were the years between the end of the TV series and uh, when Kirk takes over uh, the Enterprise again in the uh, motion picture. So I've got, I guess there's four books in this series. And I believe the first one, or it might be the last one, is Star Trek The Lost Years. And it's a pretty big one. It's by J.M. Dillard, solid writer. Ooh, font small too. A good 450 pages here. And then, uh, what exactly happened to the crew of the Enterprise after the end of their five year mission? How did the mission end? What did they do before they were reunited for the adventures captured in the movies? Even the casual Star Trek fan finds himself asking these questions from time to time. Here at last is the novel that provides the answers to those questions. The Lost Years tells the story of Captain Kirk's final hours in command of the USS Enterprise and how he, Spock, and McCoy struggled to establish new lives apart from each other in the ship. We see the newly promoted Admiral Kirk in charge of a specially created Starfleet division 
as he attempts to defuse a critical hostage situation. Mr. Spock, who in the midst of a teaching assignment on Vulcan, finds the one thing he least expected. And Dr. McCoy, whose unerring instinct for trouble lands him smack in the middle of an incident that would trigger an interstellar bloodbath. All right, sounds good. I read this one. Don't remember much about it, but I do remember reading it back in the day. And then the uh, next book in the series would be Star Trek, A Flag Full of Stars, the second book in the series. And this one's got a Klingon on the cover. Clerks messing with Klingons, you know things are going to be interesting, right? It has been 18 months since the Enterprise completed her historic five-year mission and her legendary crew has separated, taking new assignments that span the galaxy. On Earth, Admiral James T. Kirk is married and started a new life as the chief of Starfleet operations, where he is overseeing the refit of his beloved ship, now commanded by a new captain, Willard Decker. Kirk's only tie to his former crewmates is his chief of staff, a young lieutenant commander named Kevin Riley. But Kirk's new quiet life changes when he meets a scientist named Gadath, who's on the brink of perhaps the greatest scientific discovery in a century. Gadath's invention could mean tremendous strides in Federation technology or, in the wrong hands, the subjugation of countless worlds. When Klingon agents capture this new technology, Admiral Kirk and Lieutenant Commander Riley are all that stand between peace and devastation for the entire Federation. And this one's not quite as long. This one's about 240 pages. It's, it's more of a normal length Star Trek novel. And then the next one in this series, Star Trek Traitor Wins by L.A. Graff. And this one's got a picture of Kirk. Usually when you see Kirk, you see Spock and McCoy, but in this one you've got Kirk and Sudo and Chekhov. It began with the lost years, the long-awaited story of what happened to Captain Kirk and the legendary crew of the USS Enterprise when their original five-year mission ended. Now it's more than a year later, and Kirk and his crew have settled into their new separate assignments. But when Sudo and Chekhov find themselves framed for murder and treason, the two officers are forced to go into hiding. As Admiral Kirk and Uhura frantically search for evidence to prove Sudo and Chekhov innocent, they uncover a plot that threatens the very foundations of Starfleet. The web of conspiracy is woven to either as the real culprits and Federation agents close in on the fugitives. Unsure of whom to trust, and with time running out, the former USS Enterprise shipmates must once again rely on each other to find the truth and prevent the Federation from facing utter destruction. I just want to point out, and you may have noticed this already, we've looked at three, five, six, seven, eight books now. And every single one of them, the Federation is right on the eve of destruction. And it, they don't have small adventures. All these adventures are big, big, big every time. One of the things my friends and I noticed too when we were going to see Star Trek movies at the theater was that uh, the Enterprise was always the only ship in the quadrant. They never had all their equipment running. They never had a full staff but they were always the closest ship in the sector, so they always had to go take care of it in spite of the fact that they weren't running on full steam. So I guess the final book in the best-selling Lost Years saga is called Star Trek Recovery. And I like this one because Bones has his beard. Growing a beard is an awesome thing to do, and he's got a righteous beard. It began with the Lost Years, the story of what happened to Captain Kirk and the legendary crew of the Enterprise when their original five-year mission ended. The saga continued in a flag full of stars and traitor winds. Now, in recovery, J.M. Dillard brings to an end one of the most exciting chapters in Star Trek history. Admiral James T. Kirk, former captain of the USS Enterprise and now chief of Starfleet operations, is at a crossroads in his career. When he is assigned to supervise the testing of the USS Recovery, an experimental new rescue vessel, he begins to realize how tired he is of being trapped behind a desk away from the action. Fully automated, the recovery is a high-speed transport vessel capable of evacuating large populations without risking the lives of Starfleet personnel. But when its creator falls under alien influence, the recovery becomes a pawn in a deadly game that could lead to interstellar war. Trapped in the bowels of the ship is Admiral Kirk's old friend, Dr. Leonard Bones, Bones McCoy, who's being hunted by a homicidal madman determined that no one on the ship will survive. 
Taking command of a starship, Admiral Kirk must find a way to save Dr. McCoy's life and save the galaxy from deadly chaos. So yeah, it's not enough we got a homicidal maniac trying to kill McCoy. You know, they're going to put uh, the whole galaxy in chaos. Stakes have never been bigger. Okay, so this is number two. It's number 72. I didn't read off the numbers for any of these, but the Star Trek novels were numbered for the longest time, which I always thought was cool. I like collecting things and I like collecting things with a number on them because it makes it easier. But this one is Star Trek novel number 72, Star Trek The Better Man. Dr. McCoy must save the life of the daughter he never knew. I'm enjoying just reading the back covers of these. I can't wait to read the novels. When the planet Imperia, a colony of genetically perfected human beings, demands that the Federation remove a science station, which has been in place for nearly 20 years, the Starship Enterprise is assigned a transport to the planet the Federation ambassador who negotiated with the Imperians long ago, an ambassador who was once Dr. McCoy's closest friend, but is now a bitter rival. On Imperia, McCoy discovers Anna, a daughter he never knew he had. McCoy soon realizes that the isolationist Empyreans must not learn her father is an off-worlder and that her genes are less than perfect. As relations with the Empyreans collapse around him, McCoy must find a way to save his newfound daughter from the harshest penalty her planet can impose. I don't know. Harshest penalty they can impose? Sounds like a death sentence to me. Boy, I hope they get that one figured out. Okay, so now I've gotten some of these older ones here, okay? This is called Star Trek Time Trap, the new novel by David Dvorkin. I get a big kick out of this cover because Kirk's dressed all in black hair. Captain Kirk is stranded in a strange new Klingon empire 100 years in the future. Now, that's a cool plot line. I don't care what anybody says. In a remote area of Federation space, the Enterprise picks up an urgent distress signal from a Klingon vessel. Tracing the SOS, the crew finds the Klingon cruiser Mahler trapped in a dimensional storm of unprecedented power. Yet, paradoxically, the ship refuses both the Enterprise's call and the offers of help. The determined to discover what the Klingons are doing in Federation space, Kirk beams aboard their ship with a security team. Just as the storm flares to its highest intensity, as the bridge crew watches in horror, Mahler vanishes from the Enterprise view screen, and James T. Kirk awakens 100 years in the future. Ha! <laughs> this could almost be a crossover with the Shatnerverse novels, because that's when they take place, is 100 years after the original series. All right. This is number 15 in the numbered series, Star Trek Corona, a novel by Greg Bear. A cosmic force rules a distant planetoid. And the universe is about to explode. Whole universe is going to explode in this one. I love it. An awesome sentient force of protostars, Corona, has taken control of a stranded team of Vulcan scientists. The Enterprise has come on a rescue mission with a female reporter and a new computer that can override Kirk's command. Suddenly, the rescuers must save themselves and the entire universe before Corona unleashes a big bang. <laughs> That sounds cool. I know I hadn't read that one. This one I've heard about many times. I hadn't read it. It's uh, Star Trek The Klingon Gambit. It's another one of these time skating novels. And even though it's not very long, man, the font is small in there. I may have to buy some of those reading glasses that like really magnify and blow things up. Or maybe I'll just see if I can find a copy of this on the Kindle where it blows it up automatically. So. I don't know. The Klingons are hungry for war, and their target is the Enterprise, of course. When Captain Kirk and his crew are ordered to Alnath 2 to challenge the deadliest Klingon starship, Terror, they're ready for anything, or so they think. But the defenseless Vulcan crew of a Federation science ship has been wiped out. The remaining members of the Alnath 2 mission have discovered a fabulous ancient city, but their report doesn't make sense. The Klingon battlecruiser has the Enterprise in its sights and is ready to destroy it. But Captain Kirk can't seem to make decisions. Spock has started to throw temper tantrums, and Chekhov has disobeyed vital orders. The crew of the Enterprise are losing their minds, one by one, all victims of the Klingon gambit. I like it. 
that's some pulp fig that's some pulp writing right there so yeah i haven't read that before but i'm i'm ready to dig into that one that sounds great will the klingons rule at last a magnificent new star trek novel the covenant of the crown by howard weinstein the first time i saw that author's name there i thought of that fellow who's in jail harold weinstein maybe i can't remember his last name anyway not the same guy i don't even think they're related the Shadden Crown is the key to power, and the Klingons have the advantage. An Enterprise shuttle is forced to crash land in a violent storm on the barren planet Sigma-1212. Spock, McCoy, and Kalen, the beautiful heir to the Shadden throne, survive in the near disaster. I wonder what's going to happen with this beautiful heir. Now pursued by primitive hunters and a band of Klingon scouts, they must reach the mountain where the fabulous dynastic crown is hidden. With the help of Spock and McCoy and her own fantastic mental powers, Kaylin must prove that she alone is the true heir to the throne. If they fail, they will open the door for Klingon takeover of the whole quadrant, and the galaxy's hope to live long and prosper will fall in the shadow of a cruel tyranny. So I don't know. Sounds kind of interesting. Honestly, it doesn't sound as interesting as the one I read before that, though. Okay, this is the last Star Trek novel from this shelf. The other books on the shelf were not Star Trek novels. And this one is number 12, Mutiny on the Enterprise, a novel by Robert E. Vardman. I wonder what this is about. The ship is crippled in orbit around a dangerous, living, breathing planet, and a desperate peace mission to the Orion Arm is stalled. Kirk has never needed his crew more. But a life alien woman is casting a spell of pacifism and now mutiny over the crew. Suddenly, Captain Kirk's journey for peace has turned into a terrifying war to retake command of his ship. Oh, well, that sounds pretty cool. You know, how, how would Kirk handle a mutiny? I don't know. Find out in the book. You know, most of these books are high concept standalone novels, so they're a lot of fun to read. And I got a whole mess of them in my other room on another bookshelf, and I got a whole mess of them on my Kindle, too. But let's look at what else was on this shelf. Okay, here's a novel by C.S. Graham called The Solomon Effect. I don't know where I got this. I think one of my daughters bought it for me. It's a mass market paperback, and it's in good shape. This is 16 years old. It was published and printed in 2009. A German U-boat lost in the final days of the Second World War rested silent and dead in the deep waters off the Russian coast for more than half a century, carrying a cargo too terrifying to contemplate. Now it has been found, and its terrible treasure liberated by those who had set the world on fire. A remote viewer working in the top secret for the U.S. government, October Guinness, that's a good name, October Guinness, can see events occurring on the other side of the globe. But she and her loose cannon partner, CIA agent Jax Alexander, who questions the validity of Toby's gift, have arrived too late to prevent a bloodbath and perhaps the apocalypse as well. Now every second brings the unthinkable a step closer and places Toby and Jax in the gun sights of powerful enemies in frighteningly high places as they race to connect the dots between an impending catastrophe and a nightmare cultivated decades earlier by Nazi scientists with an evil agenda about to become all too real. I don't know, maybe it's good. There's a lot of purple prose on the back cover, but that doesn't necessarily mean the book's bad. I'm going to check it out and see one of these days. This isn't a TBR list. This is just a bookshelf term. Okay, so this next one is an 87th Precinct novel by Ed McBain. It's titled Poison. I don't know if you're familiar with Ed McBain, but he probably wrote the best uh, police procedural novels of all time. He's a terrific writer. My mom collected books from him, and, and now later in life, I'm starting to really get into him too. Um, a young man lay sprawled on the carpet, the phone clenched in his fist. His call for help strangled by a lethal dose of poison. The gorgeous blonde had lips that begged to be kissed and a body that no one could refuse. 
But to the men who had loved her till death did them part, she was pure poison. See where this is going here. The homicide cop had broken a cardinal rule. Never get involved or in bed with a suspect. Now his obsession could land him in the morgue unless he discovered whether the heart-stopping beauty was a lady or a femme fatale with a passion for poison. Sounds good, man. Um, sounds better than the cover would have you think because I've read Eggman and I really like it. In fact, let me give you a little taste of his writing here. This is some mess in here, Monaghan said. This is some stink in here, Monroe said. The two homicide detectives peered cautiously at the dead body on the carpet and then circled around Al Wallace, who was also looking down at the corpse, hands on his hips. It's pretty easy to maneuver around Willis, as small as he was. Monaghan and Monroe, built like mastodons themselves, were both thinking that they would not like to be partnered with any detective as small as Willis. A thin, wiry squirt who barely would have passed the five foot eight height requirement back in the old days. Although nowadays you could be the size of a fire hydrant and you couldn't be discriminated against because of fair hiring practices. You got some cops in this city. You could fit them in your vest pocket. <laughs> the guy's a good rider, man. Ain't no getting around it. So, when I was growing up, they used to do something called novelizations of movies. And uh, basically, it was just a novel based on the movie story. And uh, it kind of got out of fashion a few years ago. I don't remember when or why. It was a gradual thing, kind of like 3D movies. You know, they become popular and then they become less popular. But Quentin Tarantino decided to do a novelization of his own movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which I understand has significant differences from the film. Um, anyway, it looks really great. Looks like the kind of novelization you would have bought back in the day. He's a big nostalgia guy. And, of course, more pictures from the movie on the back here. So, uh, yeah, if you've seen the movie, you're probably going to like the book. I haven't read it yet. It's long, but that's not to be... I mean, that should be no surprise there. Um, we got exactly 400 pages. Tarantino came out with a couple of books that year. The other one was called Cinema Speculation, which I re reviewed for my channel here. But here's the inside cover. Rick Dalton. Once he had his own TV series, but now Rick's a washed up villain of the week. Drowning his sorrows in whiskey sours. Will a phone call from Rome save his fate or seal it? Cliff Booth, Rick's stunt double and the most infamous man on any movie set because he's the only one there who might have gotten away with murder. Sharon Tate. She left Texas to chase a movie star dream and found it. Sharon's salad days are now spent on Cielo Drive, high in the Hollywood Hills. Charles Manson. The ex-con's got a bunch of zonked-out hippies thinking he's their spiritual leader, but he'd trade it all to be a rock and roll star. Hollywood, 1969. You should have been there. This one's going to be fun. I've got another uh, novelization over there on my nightstand. It's, uh, it's a novelization of... Halloween ends, I think it is, but uh, but it's also an unusual one because it uh, clarifies some things um, that weren't necessarily clear in the movie. I haven't read it yet either, but I'm going to. So most of you know that I'm a horror fan. I've got a book here by Charles Grant, who Stephen King calls one of the premier horror writers of his or any generation. It's called The Black Carousel, and this is a first edition. It's lovely, really nice. This is a bunch of quotes praising Charles Grant on the back. I'm not going to read those. By day, the village of Oxrun Station seems an ordinary place filled with ordinary people who have ordinary problems. A lonely postman drinks too much. A little girl uprooted by an unwanted move longs for a friend. A young man dreams of freedom. An old man fears that age will soon steal even the ghosts of memory. When night comes to Oxrun Station, the gates of a mysterious, compelling carnival swing wide, welcoming all. But the price of admission to this dark, fantastical place can be terrifyingly high. At the carnival's core is the black carousel, whirling to a special rhythm that is almost a heartbeat. Its creatures seem alive in the flickering lights as they spin hypnotically past, 
transforming watchers into riders, riders into what? Fate prowls the fairgrounds, leading residents of Ox Run Station in a lyrical, sinister dance of life and death. A waltz of visions not quite seen or seen too clearly, of fond hopes and fevered dreams, wish fulfillment and madness until the music stops. Ox Run Station is a town like no other, home to all manner of terrors, a deceptively simple, seductively surreal town where strange things happen as a matter of course. Featured in The Last Call of Morning, The Hour of the Ox Run Dead, The Grave, The Orchard, and many other books, this fertile haunting ground remains Charles Grant's most enduring creation. Now, after a 10-year absence, Grant returns to the Ox Run Station with the Black Carousel. So if that sounds anything like Something Wicked This Way Comes, it's pretty well known that Stephen King's a big fan of Something Wicked This Way Comes, especially the carousel. Um, I don't doubt that he and Charles Grant, having been friends, have discussed that at great length. And, you know, the idea of a magical carousel and a magical park, you know, is pretty evocative. So so there's no surprise there that there have been multiple stories written about that. So this is not a horror book. This is more of a turn-of-the-century adventure kind of thing. Chester Himes wrote Cotton Comes to Harlem, which I was doing as a buddy read with my friend Mark from Book Time with Ellis. But then he actually finished reading it, and I got distracted by something else. So uh, this was made into a movie. Um, it's part of the Coffin Ed Johnson and Graver Digger Jones series of books, of which there are eight or nine. And uh, Flim Flam Man Deke O'Hara is no sooner out of Atlanta's state penitentiary than he's back on the streets working the scam of a lifetime. A sponsor of the Back to Africa movement, he's counting on a big Harlem rally to produce a massive collection for his own private charity. But the take is hijacked by white gunmen and hidden in a bale of cotton that suddenly everyone wants to get their hands on. As NYPD detectives Coffin Ed Johnson and Gravedigger Jones piece together the complexity of the scheme, we are treated to Himes' brand of hard-boiled crime fiction at its very best. And I will say, when it comes to hard-boiled crime fiction, Chester Himes is a hell of a good writer. I've only read one of his other books, but it was solid. And I've read, I think I got through about half of this before I got distracted. I saw something shiny. It's not a DNF because I'm coming back to it. Okay, so we've got uh, A Coffin for Demetrius by Eric Ambler. This is uh, another adventure story, if you will. A chance encounter with a Turkish colonel leads Charles Latimer, the author of a handful of successful mysteries, into a world of sinister political and criminal maneuvers. At first, merely curious to reconstruct the career of the notorious Demetrius, whose body has been identified in an Istanbul morgue, Latimer soon finds himself caught up in a shadowy web of assassination, espionage, drugs, and treachery that spans the Balkans. The classic story of an ordinary man seemingly out of his death, A Coffin for Demetrios, remains Eric Ambler's most widely acclaimed novel. So, you know... That was, I know where I found that one. Michael Durda had uh, written an article about adventure novels, and this is one of the ones that he re recommended that were published after a specific date. Okay, so next I've got a book here called Ex Libris by Anne Fadiman, Confessions of a Common Reader. Don't remember anything about this, although I'm sure I've read it. But I like books that are full of essays about books, and that's what this is. Yeah, so I need, to, I need to get back into this, read it again, since I don't remember it. But uh, but I'm sure it's good. You know, she's got a great reputation, but I'll show you the table of contents here. Obviously, the essays are very short because it's not a very long book. It looks like, you know, biggest one might be 10 pages long. One of the cool things about these books, too, is they're great for coming up with ideas for things to read. I'm always looking for something new to read. And I need to move this to my section of Christmas books. This is called Christmas in Plains, Memories by Jimmy Carter. Oh, what did we do to deserve someone like Jimmy Carter in this country and in this world, man? Um, absolutely terrific. A hero to my father, a hero to me. In this acclaimed bestseller, President Carter returns to his early years in Plains, Georgia, 
the same locale that enchanted readers of an hour before daylight, which the New Yorker called an American classic. He remembers the Christmas days of his boyhood and later years, recreating here the simplicity of community and celebration with family and friends. Jimmy Carter has written another American classic in the tradition of Truman Capote's A Christmas Memory and Dylan Thomas's A Child's Christmas in Wales. So I haven't read this, um, but I keep meaning to, and I'm really excited about it because, like I say, big, big fan of, of Jimmy Carter. So there's a lot of books on this shelf. A lot of them are kind of thin, so that's why there's so many. I promise there's not many more, so stick with me here. Stoner by John Williams. This is from the New York Review of Books. Man, I thought this was a terrific book. Um, William Stoner is born at the end of the 19th century into a dirt poor Missouri farming family. He's sent to the State University to study agronomy, but he falls in love with English literature and embraces a scholar's life instead. So different from the hard scrabble existence he has known. And yet, as the years pass, Stoner encounters a succession of disappointments. Marriage into a proper family estranges him from his parents. His career is stymied. His wife and daughter turn coldly away from him. A transforming experience of new love ends under the threat of a scandal. Driven ever deeper within himself, Stoner rediscovers the stoic silence of his forebears and confronts an essential solitude. Great book. Absolutely terrific. Don't have much to say about it other than, man, I really want to reread it now that I've read the back cover. All right, last two. This is one I borrowed from my daughter, Maddie. Been meaning to read it for a long time. The explosive New York Times bestseller, If I Did It, Confessions of the Killer. And you'll notice that the word if has been put in here real small, okay? Basically, it says I did it. Um... Yeah, I guess, I guess O.J. Simpson thought he was going to write a true crime novel about the murder of his ex-wife and profit from it, even though he owed all this money to uh, the Goldman's family because he'd been found liable for her death. Just, that's just crazy. But I understand that this is ghostwritten, and that uh, there's only, I think, one chapter that details the killing. But... Uh, I saw him read some of that section from that. Anyway, yeah, obviously OJ did it. We've known for a long time. Um, it's not a particularly complicated thing. But I haven't read this yet. I need to. I like true crime, but I don't like it that much. So I rarely read it. But uh, I'm trying to think. The best and first true crime novel that I ever read was called The Killer Beside Me by Ann Rule. And it was recommended to me by a guy I worked with because he was the head of security at Hotels.com, the company that I worked at. And you had to have a badge to get in and out of the, the floor where you were working. And if you didn't have your badge, you had to go to the eighth floor. You know, we were on the second floor. You had to go to the eighth floor, sign in, and get a new badge. And uh, I told him it was silly when, you know, this is somebody I know. I can just let him in. He said, here's the thing. You think you know these people, but you don't. What if this person got fired yesterday and he came back to get revenge on the people that fired him? I'm like, come on, seriously? He said, Rand, read The Killer Beside Me by Ann Rule. Turns out um, she was, worked as a volunteer on some kind of uh, suicide hotline with oh, this famous serial killer. She didn't realize he was a serial killer, though. Uh, Ted Bundy is the one. Yeah, every, all the women were in love with Ted Bundy anyway. But, uh, but yeah, she had been friends with him for a year. Okay, and not any kind of weird friendship or anything like that. But like, you know, she was kind of like a big sister figure to him. And, you know, they'd go out to breakfast. He was dealing with some depression. You know, she was dealing with her book and stuff. But, uh, but she had no idea who it was she'd been sitting next to until they started to catch him. And she eventually put two and two together. But, but he makes a good point. You know, it takes a long time to really get to know someone. I mean, it, it just does. It really does. So, uh, you know, I'm always amazed at these people who, who move in together as boyfriend and girlfriend, and they've only known each other for like three days or three weeks or whatever. It's, it's, it's not a pleasant picture. So anyway, um, I'm rambling pretty far afield now. Okay, so the final book on this bookshelf is called The Survivor, Bill Clinton in the Wild White House. Great cover artwork. That's a really good photo there of him. Um, a lot of people don't like Bill Clinton. I like Bill Clinton. Um, 
There was another Bill Clinton biography that basically led right up to the time that he went into the White House. This is from the time he goes into the White House until he leaves. So it's kind of like a sequel, but it's written by someone else entirely. Uh, the Atlantic Monthly said this is a responsible, honest, tough, and best of all, considered assessment of Clinton's presidency. In the Survivor, the award-winning veteran Washington Post White House correspondent, John F. Harris, provides the first comprehensive and objective analysis of Bill Clinton's leadership and its consequences. Bill and Hillary Clinton arrived at the White House in January of 1993, armed with an ambitious agenda and filled with mistrust of the Washington establishment. After early setbacks, the Clinton's ill-fated attempt to overhaul health care and the Republican takeover of Congress, Clinton refashioned his presidency by successfully crafting a new strain of centrist politics. Yet as Harris shows in his accounts of this president's political frustrations and the personal controversies that continuously dogged him, Clinton never transcended his tendency to favor conciliation over clarity or his own destructive appetites. I don't think they're necessarily talking about McDonald's cheeseburgers there either. The Survivor is a book filled with major revelations as well as the minor details that leaven all great political narratives. This long-awaited evaluation of the dominant themes, events, and personalities of the Clinton years is thorough, readable, and scrupulously honest. A complex, interesting, and subtle book about a complex, interesting, and subtle man. And that's a quote from the New York Times book review. Anyway, I read the book prior to this, which was really good, but I haven't read this one yet. Um, pretty long book. It's 400 and something pages, and it's a uh, pretty small type, too. But yeah, I'm going to dig back into that one sometime. I've gotten about seven chapters in. So, you know, I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I'm about 20% into this one. So, But I'm going to start over again since I hadn't finished it. And that, my friends, is Bookshelf Tour number four from 2024. I feel like at the rate I'm going, I might actually get through all my bookshelves in here. Uh, but then I've got to go into the other rooms too. So, But anyway, I hope you're getting a kick out of seeing what kind of books I have on my shelves here. Some of them are books that I've forgotten all about. I feel like my taste in books is pretty eclectic. But, uh, you know, you be the judge and let me know. Uh, at any rate, until the next video, I want to thank you for watching this one. Stay sexy out there and stay hydrated.